Well, sorry, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Uh, hopefully you had a chance to read the gospel passage from this morning. It was from Mark chapter 10, uh, verses 17 to 31. I'll say it one more time. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to 31. And if you've been following along with us, the theme of this month of Hator um, has been really the Bible and the work of the Bible in our lives. Uh, if you remember the first two Sundays, uh, today we're on the fourth Sunday, by the way. On the first two Sundays was the parable of the sower. Um, it, that was consecutive. And then last Sunday, we read about uh, taking up your cross and, and, and Abuna reflected on Thanksgiving. And today we see the fourth Sunday um, that talks about what is our response to the word? What is our response to um, hearing the preaching of our Lord Jesus Christ? And today our Lord says, go and sell what you have. And so the, we focus on themes of wealth and generosity and riches and giving them away. And the concept, the combination of these concepts are really at the very heart of our Lord's teachings. The richest person in the world is a person who gives it away. And our Lord teaches us to give away, to give away ourselves, to give away um, love, to give away our time, to give away our money. One thing that the, the church fathers write, they say, for it is in giving that we receive. It is in forgiving that we are forgiven. It is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. So in the gospel, we read that Jesus told the, the rich young man that although he has kept the commandments, one thing he must do uh, to inherit eternal life is that he must sell all that he owns. He must uh, distribute the money to the poor and then come and follow him. But we see the reaction. We see when, when this young man heard this, he became sad because he was very rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Well, someone might say, well, that, that's very strict. Like Jesus is being too strict here. The, the young rich ruler is a good person, but Jesus is going to exclude him from heaven because he's missing that one thing. Um, why would Jesus condemn a person for the one thing that they lack? Um, Father Anthony Conarius, in his sermon, One Thing You Still Lack, um, this is taken from a, a book that I like. It's called Gems of the Sunday Gospels. Um, anyways, he, he explains this uh, a little bit, and he actually compares two ancient Greek philosophers, Socrates and Plato. And he says in his sermon, Socrates claimed that a person was morally acceptable if the evil deeds in his life were balanced by the good deeds. Okay. Plato, on the other hand, disagreed with Socrates. Um, he taught that, that personality is like, um, like a chain and it's only as strong as the weakest link. And so the ladder that, that is missing a rung or two is useless. Um, a boat can sink if there's even one small hole in the hull of the boat. And this is more aligned to our Lord's teachings. He says that one thing can make the difference between life and death. One sin can ruin an otherwise moral life. One weak link in the chain of our lives can jeopardize our salvation. It's not to be taken lightly. And our Lord emphasizes this point in his sermon on the Mount uh, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, when he says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one, one jot or one little tittle uh, will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men uh, so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so, and later on in Matthew chapter five, he says, uh, therefore ye shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. And even St. James in his epistle said, something similar in James chapter two. 
around verse 10, he says, For whoever shall keep the whole law, yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Now, okay, so with all that said, if this is true, what hope do we have? Surely all of us will be shut out from the kingdom of heaven. And so Satan wants us to believe that we have no hope. He wants to rob us of any hope whatsoever, because without hope, we can be totally lost. And the disciples were worried about this when they asked Jesus at the end. And they said, then who can be saved? They said this in verse 26. How did our Lord answer? He told them, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. This is verse 27. So instead of losing hope, we must throw our whole selves completely into the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And only then, based on his love and his forgiveness, can we begin to find out what is still lacking in our journey towards salvation. So when we go back to the story of the, the rich young ruler, what was the one thing that kept him away from eternal life at that point? It was his possessions. It was his wealth. It was his money. Even though he had fulfilled many, if not most of the commandments, he violated the first commandment. You shall not have any other gods before me. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. The passage relates to that he became very sorrowful. He became very sad because he had great possessions. Again, our Lord is the good physician. And as such, he does not prescribe the same medication for every single patient. Not everyone gets the same medicine. So our Lord may not ask us to sell all our possessions and give the proceeds to the poor. However, he does, he does give us the command to tithe as an antidote. Why? To what? Because if we're not taking the blessing of, of, of our tithe, we can fall into greed. We can fall into materialism. And so as a cure for this, our Lord has prescribed the tithe for the church. But if we can't manage to give even 1% to the Lord, not even 10%, right? If we can't even give 1% to the Lord when he asks for 10, are we not also lacking the one thing in order to inherit eternal life? It's, it's a message that we have to reflect on. As the physician of our souls and our bodies, our Lord is the good surgeon who can diagnose and remove any tumor that threatens our spiritual death. And, and so in our med if our medical doctor told us that you have a cancerous tumor in your kidney, but uh, you know it's so invasive that we have to remove the whole kidney, would you do it? Uh, of course, probably you'd probably have the surgery because we know that we can live with only one kidney, but we don't want to risk the cancer spreading to other parts of our body. So when our Lord Jesus Christ makes the same analogy, he makes the same analogy with our spiritual health. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you to that one of your members shall perish than your whole body be cast into hell. For if your right eye, if your right hand causes you to sin, Cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So if the Lord is telling us that we can keep 90% of our income and wealth, but we need to cut off or cut away 10% with a tithe to him, is this not the same principle? And so then how do we respond to the priest or uh, when the church asks for the tithe? Do we become sorrowful? Do we become angry? Do we become uncomfortable? Do we blow it off? You know, do we get upset with the priest for bringing up money? All of these responses are signs that we still lack the one thing to inherit eternal life. So then the question becomes, why is it hard for people with riches to enter the kingdom of God? Why is this difficult in order to become a true disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we can think of a few reasons. Number one, it's easy to fall in love with money. Money and wealth is seductive and it's easy to fall in love with. We become addicted. We become addicted to money. We become addicted to material possessions. Um, and like most addictions, we don't initially re realize it until it's gone too far and we are really in the addiction. Uh, so we have to be careful about this. Number two, wealth creates a false sense of security. We think that wealth will protect us 
from the disasters of life. And we find out it doesn't. Um, money oftentimes make people selfish. <clears throat> um, whether it's the purpose of time or talents or energy, we only serve ourselves when it comes to money. We have to be careful with these, with these notions. Again, these are generalizations. It's not meant for everybody. Sometimes God does bless those with, with great wealth um, because he knows their heart and their generous spirit. So Christ's teachings do challenge us on what it means to own anything, right? Do we even really own things? It's a question that we have to think about. Or are these things given to us by God as a stewardship for the short time that we have on earth? Some of the saints uh, noted this property, this, these possessions are not really ours. And it's proof of this time comes to an end. And we all have an expiration date, as it's put. Um, no matter what, when we leave them all behind, no matter how much we valued these things, no matter how hard we've worked for them, um, you can't take it with you. Uh, and it's, you know, it's just the reality of the experience of death. So how serious is our relationship to our income and our wealth? Our Lord noticed the sad response in verse 24. And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Some of, some of us might be reflecting on it and saying, well, I'm not rich. That doesn't apply to me. I mean, thank God I'm not rich. Yet for most of us here uh, that are listening, that are in Southern California, that are part of this parish or part of other churches that are listening, um, you know, we're among the top five people, uh, richest, uh, top 5% richest people in the world. And if we tie to the church, we're still in the top 5%. So what's the problem? The problem is that we don't trust in God. We don't trust in God. We want to hold back something extra for ourselves because we believe that we cannot live or live as comfortably without it. So uh, one thing still lacks is this is like a certain room uh, in our house that we don't want to go into. <clears throat> we keep that door uh, shut. We keep that door locked. For some of us, it's wealth. For others, it's ambition. For some people, it's hatred or anger. We say, God, you can have everything, but not this one thing. You can enter any room of my house, but not this one. And by doing this, we make an idol of that one department in our life. By putting in the words of St. Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, that one room that God cannot enter is in secrecy and darkness. And the only way that light can enter is to open the door. This is what the sacrament of confession is all about. Opening the door. Opening the door to the dark rooms of our lives so that Christ can and his light can shine. That he can shine inside and the fresh air of the Holy Spirit can, can be present. This is true healing and this is true forgiveness. One of the commentators of, of this passage notes that the young rich ruler thought that God belonged in the synagogue only. In other words, he had no business uh, in the world of finance. But Jesus insisted that God belongs in every single department in our lives. So we should raise the question, well, what if the rich young ruler had sold all and followed Christ? He might be honored today as one of the apostles, as one of the saints. He might have an icon in the church. Yet because he loved his money more than God, he refused our Lord's invitation. And now his name is lost in history. So what is the one thing that we still lack in our lives? Is it some sin? Is it a sin that we refuse to let go? Is it a relationship that we refuse to uh, be rid of or to separate ourselves from? Is it some part of our lives that we refuse to surrender to God? Is it is it some love that we, we place above our love of Christ? Is it some person that we refuse to forgive? Remember, that one thing, it's a, it's a sobering thought, that one thing 
can keep us out of the kingdom of heaven. So today our Lord presents us with a model of spiritual perfection in conforming to the image of God within us. We need to strive to fulfill this model in order to enter the kingdom of heaven and to live eternally with God. This model is followed um, literally in preparation for monastic life. Unfortunately, this model is also dismissed completely by some Christians who say it only applies to the monks and nuns. So we live in extremes sometimes. So how does it apply to us? We who live in this world, who have jobs, who have a spouse or, or have children or may, may not have children. But how, do, how does this apply to us? Let's keep in mind that the monastic life is not completely different than our own. What's different about the monastic life, the life of the monk, the life of the nun, is not of, of it's that of degree. It's not a form. What I mean by that is they pray more. And that's, again, a generalization. They worship more. They repent more. They're obedient more. They give away their possessions more, right? But we who live in the world must still pray. We still worship. We still repent. We still are obedient. We are still selling our possessions. We still give to the poor. We still follow Christ. So when our Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 21 then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. So following me, carrying your cross. This is the true kingdom of Christ. It's the way that many reject. Some, you know, they draw this imaginary picture of the kingdom seeking their comfort and joy. And they imagine that the kingdom of heaven, of kingdom of Christ, is just a place of enjoyment. But the kingdom of Christ, the, the kingdom starts with self-denial. And it starts with a crucifixion. We die in Christ and we live eternally. We are crucified with him to rise with him, to dwell in, with him in eternal life. Those who don't accept our Lord's crucifixion, they have no part in his glory and his resurrection. Therefore, at the core of the matter is that the wealth of this young man created an obstacle blocking him from salvation. His wealth became pleasurable, which have this distanced him from the cross. We are in dire need of the cross, which places a limit to the desire uh, and, and the worldly pleasures in our lives. The, the cross nails our humanity with this crucifixion, and we are freed from all bounds. Our Lord was asking for a positive action from this young man. Do something positive for the poor people. And the Ten Commandments, people were commanded by God to avoid doing bad things to others. That's good, and that's proper. We should avoid doing bad things to others, but it's not the same as doing good for others especially the poor. Avoiding doing bad to someone is not the same as doing something good for them. We expect people to avoid doing bad to others. We, we expect people not to kill each other. We expect people not to commit adultery. We expect people not to steal and lie and defraud. But it's something else to do something beneficial for them, even with nothing in return. And so, in summary... <clears throat> It would be easy to misunderstand Jesus here and to assume that it's impossible for a rich person to get to heaven. But Jesus was most likely making an example of this self-righteous ru ruler. He's an example of a person who is convinced that he is religious, but in fact misses the whole point. He followed the letter of the law, yet he did not carry love in his heart. St. Clement, he warns us, not to interpret this passage to mean that wealth will keep us from the kingdom of heaven. He writes that it's the attitude of the soul that's more important. It's the passion for wealth, not the wealth, that it condemns a man. So our attitude towards possession reveals the true God and master in our lives. And this may be troubling for us when we feel that we've made uh, God our master and we have kept all his commandments 
as did this young ruler. Christian stewardship of our souls and bodies is offered to our entire self, to God, attaching our desire to him rather than the world. And throughout the Gospels, our Lord shows us that the only lasting wealth is spiritual wealth, which comes from God. It's time to re-examine our priorities. This is the perfect time to re-examine our priorities as we enter the new year. When we witness to Christ by the way that we set our priorities in life, this is a time to re-examine those priorities, the way in which we share our time and we share our talents and our possessions. I challenge you all to take a look at your checkbook or to look at your bank account statements and see exactly where your true priorities are. Do we commit more to TV streaming services than to you, you do to your church? It's a, it's a, forgive me, forgive me. Psalm 116 asks, what shall I give the Lord in return for all his benefits towards me? And the answer comes in a divine liturgy when we're invited to offer ourselves and offer our whole lives to Christ our God. This is where the, the life of the church is so important. When we come to the church, we are inundated with messages of, of selflessness and charity and generosity and sacrifice and love. And through sermons and Sunday school and retreats, if we can ever have them again, uh, these messages are, are more articulated so that people have a good understanding about how to practically apply them to our daily lives. Most people are, are encouraged by messages that say, you know, don't murder or don't hurt people or, or be faithful to your spouse. Don't take things that don't belong to you. Be honest and always tell the truth. Honor your parents and love your neighbor as yourself. However, when we hear about selling our possessions and giving away even a tiny portion of our wealth, it becomes uncomfortable. Even we get irritated by the message. It says that the young man went away grieving because he had many possessions. Do we grieve at the message of selling our possessions? Do we grieve at the message of giving to the poor, giving to the church? I'm going to end with a quote from St. John Chrysostom. He says, some people see the houses in which they live as their kingdom. And although in their minds they know that death will one day force them to leave, in their hearts they feel they will stay there forever. They take pride in the sides of their houses and the fine materials with which they are built. They take pleasure in decorating their houses with bright colors and obtaining the best and most solid furniture to fill their rooms. They imagine that they can find peace and security by owning a house whose walls and roof will last for many generations. We, by contrast, know that we are only temporary guests on earth. We recognize that the houses in which we live serve only as hostels on the road to eternal life. We do not seek peace or security from material walls around us or the roofs above our heads. Rather, we surround ourselves with the wall of divine grace and we look, upon, uh, we look upward to heaven as our roof and the furniture of our lives should be good works performed in the spirit of love. And glory be to God forever. Amen.